that's good enough. We'll get going. Um, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt Caggiano. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Echo Group, and I have the privilege of welcoming you to Peer to Peer 2017. This is our, the 15th year that we're doing this, and uh, you know the, the attendance is, is awesome, and we're, we're glad to have you all here. So I also always start these sessions by saying thank you, sincerely. Um, thank you for traveling all the way from, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I know some folks came from as far away as Oregon. Um, I know Kurt, where's Kurt? His, his luggage came this morning at 5 a.m. So we go to this thing last night and he's dressed in all Echo gear. It was, it was awesome. Anyways, so yeah, you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. Uh, so thank you for, for making your way here, and even more importantly, thank you for being our partner. Um, a lot of you folks have been partners with ours for many, many years, and some of you are new partners of ours, and it's extremely important as we head down this path in this journey in healthcare, um, you know, it's exciting for us, and again, we thank you for being our partner. So with that, we have a lot of sessions, and we're packed for the next two and a half days, right? So I always try to bulletize what my message is, so there's three things that I want everyone in the room to do over the next two and, a half, two and a half days. And this includes all of the ECHO folks as well. Number one, learn. Ask questions. There's 30 sessions. There's a lot of people here that have a ton of knowledge. Push us, right? Get us uncomfortable. Ask questions about what we're doing, how we're getting better, and we're going to do the same thing. The best way for us to learn is with all of the folks in this room for us to understand what you're doing, the, the pros, the cons, the challenges, and you know, the wins that we're all getting, let's learn from each other. Number two, network. 87 people from 36 different organizations. Okay, there's a, there's a pretty cool amount of knowledge in this room. Network. How many folks in the room have been with Echo for over 15 years? Right? So there is a lot of knowledge in the room. How many folks have been, are, are new to Echo, whether it's your first time at peer to peer or a new client of ours or a new partner of ours? Okay? So I'm assuming that everyone remembered exactly who was. Yeah. Anyways, so make sure that you're networking, talk to each other, share ideas. That's what that's what's make these, makes these uh, conferences very powerful. Number three, have fun. Right? So have some fun with it. We have a reception tonight. We're in downtown Portsmouth, which is a nice, li it's a, actually a beautiful little town. Um, go out, see the sites, not during session time. Um, see the sites, and again, have some fun with it. And we, you know, you have to have fun with this or it's not gonna be worth it. So again, three things, what are they? Number one, number two, number three, but not too much, just kidding. Um, so are we ready to get rolling? Are we ready to get rolling? Yeah. All right. So there's no one better than to kick off peer to peer than our founder and chairman of the board, George Epstein. George. <laughs> why, why didn't I get that when I introduced my, anyways, that's what, someday I'll learn it. Um, so George is going to give everyone a preview of our next generation software, right? We got some exciting times going on. But before George gets up here, we're going to hear from New Hampshire-born poet Robert Frost. And I had promises to keep as well. Uh, uh, 
Robert Frost, Plymouth State University, Dartmouth College, my alma mater, um, uh, he got everything right. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm tearing up and I haven't even started with the really cool part of the whole presentation. Um, uh, I have promises to keep. So last year at this time, after really a sluggish year of product development where we did not move as fast as I had hoped, last year at this event, I promised you that uh, beginning in May, we would begin billing out of the next generation Echo product line. And beginning in May, we began billing out of the Echo product line for, um, for uh, Ohio customers, um, being able to bill uh, Medicaid and uh, ultimately the payers that were necessary by those organizations in, in, um, in Ohio. And uh, I was able to sleep throughout that period preparing the software and getting it ready, but other people were not. Uh, some of them are here. Uh, Kathy is here, and Tristan is here, and Diane is here, and Tina is here, and other people are here. And uh, you'll get a chance to meet with and hear from and speak to the people who contributed to getting uh, the product moving and getting the product ready for you. Um, I got nothing but this t-shirt, and so I'm going to just keep wearing it. It's way better than a tie. Um, and. Uh, uh, and, and we were confronted with a whole bunch of decisions that we had to make, as you always do when it's a next generation product. Um, we've been around long enough for this to be our third next generation uh, product line. And really only one other vendor that's ever had to do this. And, uh, and, and that kind of time frame, that kind of experience, uh, all that we've learned from you and from your experiences, from what's happening around the country, what's happened over time in behavioral health and healthcare in general, uh, there was an awful lot that we've learned that we were able to apply to this next generation product. Uh, back in 1980, 81, 82, Bruce Trimpop, who's right back there. Goodness, you'd think he would have just sort of grown into the building and roots would have set. Um, uh, he and I and a couple other people uh, produced that first generation product. And uh, uh, it was called the HSIS, the Human Service Information System. It was the first product for behavioral health organizations that could do waterfall billing. It was the first product that could handle sliding fee scale, self-pay payments. It was the only product that could uh, provide the necessary information to do reporting to the National Institute of Mental Health, which was still where most of your reporting went to. Uh, and over the years, a whole lot of things have had to change, and things continue to have to change, and will continue to have to change. Um, we're confronted because we have customers with some interesting challenges. If you don't have any customers, it's really easy to develop software. You folks mess up the whole product development process um, because you can't just say here and give you something brand new and wish you luck. Uh, there is a, 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 an interesting challenge associated with moving you from where you are to that next generation product line. So we built out a little bitty decision tree and um, that decision tree Goodbye, Robert. We will come back to you at some point, probably. Um, uh, that decision tree, uh, boy, very sophisticated, complex uh, set of equations here. But essentially, we're, we were confronted with a series of questions over the past few years as uh, clinician's desktop and revenue manager got older, and particularly the client-server-based technology and the Delphi technology got older. Um, the first question you're confronted with is, do you just do a front-end retrofit? Do you just paint new screens using web browser stuff and connect it up to the old product, including the old processing routines, the old billing routines, and all the rest of that stuff? Or do you do a foundational change? Do you really get down into the, the bowels of things and really address all of the issues um, that exist with the existing product as it's aged and take advantage of all the new technology that's available in the the stuff that's available today. And of course, we decided to make a foundational change, which is why you head downward. And then, then you have to decide, are you going to take clinician's desktop and revenue manager and do it all at once, throw it all out and replace it with something completely new? Boy, that's rough. That's very difficult for you folks to absorb, very painful for you folks. It would be easier for us but it would be much harder for you to simply throw all that stuff out. So you try to tr create a transition a transitional process that will allow you to move from where you are today to where 
where you were five or six or seven years ago to where you are today and to where we want you to be in the future and where you want to be in the future. And so we chose a transitional approach. And then you have to make the decision about what's reasonable and practical to transition and what's impossible to transition. And what's reasonable to transition is on the clinical side. We were able to take the, what you, we now think of as the administrative view in clinician's desktop and move to the visual health record, to the VHR, to the timeline, and to all of the, for the technical people, the Java code, the web-based code that stands behind that. We could take the meaningful use functionality that was and is necessary for many of you and create that using the new technology and add that in, supplement the existing stuff. You'd still have that core, of Delphi code and the old stuff, but you wouldn't create a disruption, particularly for the clinical staff. The clinical staff are the folks that are the most expensive to keep, to make re major changes with, to completely rechange, um, uh, to rechange, to recharge, uh, and to moderate and modify all the stuff that they're dealing with on a day to day basis. Um, on a given day, about 20,000 clinical people use our software. 20,000 clinical people. And while no one of you is dealing with 20,000 people. We have to recognize what the impact would be on those 20,000 people and trying to create a transitional approach as we have over these last few years has been an important part of um, making this change as smooth and as painless as we possibly could make it. On the other hand, the financial side doesn't work that way. When you do medical billing, when you get an 835 that comes back that has claims that have been paid and you post those claims uh, against the charges that were in there, it has to go look up who the next payer is uh, and then you have to trigger bills for that next payer. It is so hand in glove, all the pieces, all the components are so tightly integrated in order to do the complexities of medical billing there was no choice. You really have to do that pretty much completely. There's no particularly smooth transition that can be done. And as a result, while the clinical software has been transitioning over the past few years, the, uh, the, the changes such as submission runner and so on that have been done on the financial side, on the billing side, have been pretty modest. And as a result, we have to do a pretty complete top to bottom changeover with regard to the billing functionality. But if we do it well enough, you will be excited at the prospect of learning something new, but learning something that's a ton better. And that's on us to make sure it's that much cooler and that much better and that much nicer. Um, uh, that was a fascinating uh, look into me and my thinking and Echo's uh, thinking process on this whole thing. But who cares? Let's take a look at the software. And Alan is going to take us there. Um, he is going to log in to Echo Vantage. Um, uh, I have been ordered to. What, what was I didn't? I'm, people, thank you very much. Yes, um, I, I feel like one of those skiers after the run, and they hold up the skis with Rosignol down the side. Um, uh, I am supposed to stay in these six squares that are here, and uh, this will be difficult for all of us, I think. Um, uh, when I log in as a primarily clinical user into Echo Vantage, uh, which is the name we have bequeathed upon this incredibly new cool thing. Um, and by the way, I've done this for a whole bunch of years. I stand up here and I tell you about what's going on at Echo and I, I don't know, I talk. Uh, and, uh, and I prepare and I try to be good and I tell you about what shampoo I use and things like that. Um, but uh, this is different. This is important. This is a big deal for me. Today is a big deal for me. And uh, I'm really interested in the kind of feedback that I get from you as a result of uh, all the efforts that a bunch of people have contributed to making this all happen. Um, um, Alan, I'm going to ask you to go to uh, Dorothy Gale. And we're just going to go right to visiting Dorothy Gale. I'm, I'm going to go back to this screen in a few minutes. Um, this is the visual health record. This is the VHR that your clinical staff, that 20,000 people today are going to use. And it looks the same. Uh, it should. It's the intent is for it to look the same. Much of the code is the same. The category depiction manager things that control the uh, 
Uh, there are too many buttons. There are three buttons on here. I know it. I know. I know. Um, you give me three buttons, and I'm going to hit the other two before I hit the one that's the right one. There we go. So, so um, the the things that you're used to seeing on here are all the same. Obviously, the the top of the screen is a little bit different, but basically, I'm looking at something that I'm comfortable with. That if I'm one of those 20,000 clinicians, I don't need a ton of retraining in order to navigate my way around here. Now, things do look different. I'm not going to click on something and jump back to a Delphi screen that looks old. Um, I'm going to click on a, cl a client profile for Dorothy Gale, and um, uh, and and Alan's going to pick up from the tone of my voice that I actually wanted him to do that. Um, uh, that the the look and feel is different, uh, and the uh, colors are soothing and calming, and uh, it has a consistency that, of course, you haven't seen in the past. Is this disruptive to your clinical staff? Ah, there's some change. Where you find a particular field that needs to be entered might be in a different place. If I click on episodes, for example, um, I'm going to find um, stuff there that's formatted a little bit differently. I have a history of the, um, the, the episodes um, shown over here. The, I'm clicking on this because this is being streamed and recorded, and the recording actually includes the uh, this button and this light, and so it's it's different from a laser pointer, but it it's crummy. I don't like it at all. So um, uh, the the uh, the the history of staff who have been assigned to this particular episode for this particular client, you you've you've got that history. You've got it presenting problems in the bottom right hand side. Um, so the format is different. There are some enhancements based on requests you've made. That ability to see the history of all the staff people right there. Um, if I look at enrollments, um, it's going to look a little bit different as well. Um, but I capture essentially the same information um, <clears throat> that I have in the past in a different format and with a, a better display of the history associated with it. Diagnosis does look different. Uh, I click there. I get a, a little card. That's the term we use for the little doodads up there. The, uh, I have two different primary diagnoses depending upon which of my uh, staff members might be seeing that individual, although this particular one is inactive because there's an end date uh, in there. If I click on oppositional defiant disorder, um, uh, I'm going to get the look and feel associated with the actual ICD code and then the DSM description. And then I can go down the road and put in the DSM-5 modifiers, excuse me, specifiers and criteria. Um, it has the look that matches, and, and the functionality, that matches the DSM-5 approach to diagnostic management. Um, there are SNOMED codes available. There are different quirks associated with it. I, I don't use primary, secondary, and so on to control whether something's billable or not. Um, uh, I have the, the power to do that separately. Um, we can talk about all those things, and actually, I'll tell you why we would. But I'm going to quit out of here for a second. <coughs> Um, so I do have the capacity to um, wander through these things that I'm used to going through and then going back to the timeline associated with Dorothy Gale brings me back to what I'm used to. Is it different? Yeah. Uh, is it disruptional? Does it require a lot of retraining for your clinical staff? No, no, no. The idea is for it to be transitional, for it to be smooth, and for it to be fast, easy to learn, but also fast and easy to operate, which is something we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, uh, the timeline, uh, what would you expect if I click on um, uh, the, um, uh, a service uh, record? You're going to see something that does look different from the activity entry, service entry that you're used to. Uh, we'll come back here and talk about this in a little more detail when I talk about billing. Uh, but uh, uh, what you're looking at there are, you know, program location activity, attendance, recipient, those ha happen to be the components that this um, organization is using and the language associated with that and so on, all that stuff's user-definable as it's always been. I have the staff person, supervisor, and so on. I'm going to ask you to click on the node, Alan. Um, uh, up will pop the uh, a note. Now, the, the note is what we call structured progress notes in clinician's desktop. Um, in this case, it, it works much the same way, although I'll show you how much easier it is 
to attach a specific note uh, to a particular type of service in a minute. Um, but of course, it's form designer based, not window designer, Windesi based. And so again, you have the consistency of look and feel, and you have the advantages associated with the speed of operation of having a single platform, not both a Delphi platform and a Java web platform, but all Java based, web based uh, software, what is what you're looking at. If I close the structured progress note, and I close the service. Um, uh, again, nothing significant to learn. Does it look different? It does. Might you recreate your structured progress note using Form Designer and have it look somewhat different and have to teach yourself? <laughs> so, no, you're shaking your head. No, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. I don't remember your name. Uh, but, but you're shaking your head. No, I'm not going to change the structured progress note. Um, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little more. At 3 o'clock today, um, Kathy Bunker and other members of the team here will lead a discussion in this room, because we want everyone to attend that, that will dive into more detail in aspects of the software that I'm showing you, and will begin to capture from you more detail with regard to your feedback. I want to give you an overview that is primarily philosophical. What we're trying to achieve, why we did some of the things we did, perhaps why we didn't do some of the things that we did, that, that's what I'm trying to capture here. But if you actually want to know anything, you want to come back here at 3 o'clock today. Um, you just get to hear me babble on. Uh, if I go down to the PHQ assessment, the uh, uh, I click on the old flag there. Um, I don't think this would be at all different from what the clinical staff would be observing today. They might have an assessment instrument. It might have been built in form designer, and it would sit behind the icon that is displayed on the BHR. So if I leave there, um, again, what was our intent? Our intent was to provide uh, a smooth transition for your clinical staff that would not involve a lot of disruption, not involve a lot of retraining, not a lot of pain and suffering associated with it. Is there some stuff? Yeah, and we can talk about that. Uh, but for the most part, it's just updating everything, making things look more consistent, making them look and work more reliably, faster, et cetera. Um, if I leave here, though, and I go back to the front page, the vantage point associated with clinical entry, you see three work areas. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the client list, which is where Alan typed in GAL. Why don't you type GAL, just to show them how you again. Um, uh, and it does that search, and it very quickly finds that particular client. It would s display your clients. That would be your client list. That's a starting point for you to access a particular individual. Um, you have your schedule down the left-hand side. If I click on week, um, I get a weekly view of the schedule. If I click on month, I uh, get what I hope I expect. And if I go to day, um, that's what I've got. That isn't finished. And there's stuff that I'll comment on throughout here that isn't finished. Um, but that isn't finished because it's new. It's new from the ground up. There's not one line of code from old scheduling in there. We decided it was really important to create the next generation scheduling piece. And it needs to be able to handle scheduling of rooms. And it needs to do a better job of handling scheduling of groups. And there have been a whole array of requests from people. And patching together the old version and jamming it in here was not the smart thing to do. So I'm giving you a heads up that this is in process. It isn't finished. Um, and you, don't, you can't wander around and do a lot of stuff here. But it is open for discussion. Things that you want to be sure are in scheduling. Those would be things you might bring up with the folks today at 3 o'clock, for example. And they'll have some questions for you that we couldn't decide among ourselves that, that you folks will contribute to. Um, so that's the scheduling. The piece over here that's completely blank, so Alan, I'm pointing over here, right? And it's going over there. Does this make any sense at all? OK. So, so um, uh, the, the, and it's clearly your fault. I mean, there's no question. <laughs> It couldn't possibly my, be, be my lack of eye-hand coordination. Right? Um, so messages and alerts is truly mysterious. You don't see anything at all there. That's because there isn't anything to show you there. <clears throat> um, from the ground up, you have echo mail. You have a signature system. You don't have any real 
internal uh, instant messaging capacity associated with Echo's existing clinician's desktop. But you, ha you have a whole bunch of stuff, and it's somewhat all over the place. In addition, you have an alert system, which people use, and it works pretty well, but it's focused on a set of alerts that we grant to you. We tell you these are alerts that you're able to set up, and you can't make up your own alerts and so on. So that's all also going out the window. And we're replacing that with a from the ground up rebuilt integrated messaging and alert system. They, they need to tell you something. It, whether it's the clinician down the hall wants you to know about this um, or schedule lunch with you, um, or whether it's um, the, the, your, we want to tell your supervisor that this progress note is ready for signature, or whether you want to be alerted about all of the, uh, the services you've entered that don't have progress notes attached to them. Whatever the alerts are, whatever the messages you want to send internally, and whatever links you want to have to particular records in the database that go along with that, that will all be handled through this messaging alerts piece. Um, it's in progress, but I don't have anything to show you with regard to that today. We'll talk about time frames and so on for completion of various pieces of the thing. But one of the keys to the time frame for completion of certain pieces of the software will be what your priorities are. And one of the things you're going to get today at 3 o'clock is a, a link to or a piece of paper or however they do it. I think they do it on an automated basis. Um, a link to a self-assessment. Um, which sounds like it's all on you, but it's something we need to do jointly. You're going to assess where your agency is at with regard to the utilization of the software, what you use, what you prioritize, what you have to have in order for you to move over to the next generation product. And the uh, priorities that we set for the order in which we deliver things will be informed by what you prioritize. What is it you want first? What do you want next? We believe it's likely that scheduling will be an absolute requirement by everybody really quickly, uh, or almost everybody really quickly, and so that's very much uh, at the top of the order of things. Uh, the alerts and messaging and so on is really important. We have more questions about that and want to, to uh, quiz you on what your preferences are, but we know that will be important. But what is the, what is the stuff that's most important to you? Um, so, for example, things like um, offline forms, which is now available in CDT, um, uh, where you can take your form designer forms on the road with you on a laptop and not be connected to the internet and capture stuff and bring it back and dump it in, that, that's, that's available now in both. Um, the uh, uh, mobile assessments, the ability to hand a tablet uh, to a client in your waiting room and say, here, please take this assessment uh, and have that integrated back into, that's in clinician's desktop today, that's also in here today. Um, uh, the uh, doctor first interface is not in here today, uh, nor are uh, the images piece, um, which uh, uh, we need and want to make a significant change to so we can, where's, where's Greater Cincinnati? Raise your head, hand, your, or, or your head. Um, okay, there you go. Um, so, what, a, a million? Okay, so, so a million images? Come on, people, you break our stuff. Um, uh, but but we, 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 want, we, want, we want whatever we have to be resilient and scalable, and whether you have a million images or you have 8,000 images, it should be as responsive and perform as well in either situation. Um, so there's stuff we need to do that isn't done. Um, we're adding stuff in right now every two weeks. There's something new in functionality being added, uh, but the pace with which that stuff's going in is going to be fast, it's going to be quick, and over the coming months, all the stuff will be put in there um, that we want. But we want to do it in order of your priorities, and so that's some of the feedback we'll get from you as a result of the, in the, the agency self-assessment that you'll be utilizing. Ah, so, priority, nice smooth transition. Minimal disruption for 20,000 clinical people, but the benefits associated with that. Um, treatment planning, I just missed that, right? I was supposed to show you the treatment plan. Looks the same, does not disrupt people that way. We want to make changes to treatment planning, but we're not doing that as part of this. 
smooth transition, nice and easy. Um, if right now, today, your clinical staff are utilizing a client profile and diagnosis and entering services and progress notes and treatment plans and assessments that you've defined using form designs, it's all there. You're ready to go. Um, scheduling to follow other pieces that do still need to follow on uh, to, to go from there. And you'll have the opportunity to ask more detailed questions. Even before I'm done here, hopefully you'll have some time for questions. But um, we made a different decision with regard to the financial piece, the medical billing piece. Um, Alan, can you pop up um, a look at uh, Revenue Manager? Okay, so there's a screen that looks familiar to those of you who have to send medical bills out. Now, medical billing is hard and crazy and insane and among the most difficult and complex processes that any business anywhere in America or the world has to face because it's Looney Tunes. It makes no sense. Its primary purpose is to enable insurance companies to keep money for as long as possible. Um, uh, you can write that down. That's a, that's a quote. Um, uh, unless there's somebody from insurance companies listening, no. Um, uh, is this streaming to insurance companies all over America? Um, I'm staying. I'm do, right, right in this. I'm staying perfectly still here. Yeah, I'm afraid to move. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, we're not evil. We didn't devise this screen because we hate you. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, 15 years ago, it looked pretty reasonable. Um, uh, and of course, it's gotten crazier in 15 years of changes by insurance companies, additional requirements, all the different state variations associated. I mean, we keep having to tack all this junk on here. And over 15 years, the thing became this. And you look at that and you say, huh, what would I do next? And so when you lose your lead billing person, or if you're a smaller engine, you have one billing person, you lose that person, you hire your next billing person, and you say, okay, this is how you bill, um, they're off to a slow start. And, and I, think, I think we all have to recognize that. Um, uh, so we devoted time and effort, and I know we've, we've shown you examples of this, but what you're going to look at now is the live echo vantage. Alan, um, uh, and if you're a clinician. Um, so the vantage point for fiscal is this screen, and um, uh, it does have one row down below. Just so you know, it doesn't go on for pages and pages. Depending upon the screen that you're using, all that would appear on your screen. That, that's, that is the screen. Um, what, what is billing? What, what is medical billing? The, the clinician sees somebody and enters a service entry, an activity entry, and records what he or she did with that particular client. Um, that's what we refer to as an unprocessed service. What do I have to do? And in this particular case, I have 22 of those sitting in there. And as a result of previous processing, I have three errors in there that are un, uncorrected. Um, uh, what do I have to do with that raw service entry that a, a clinician has entered? I have to go out and gather a whole bunch of information. I have to look up who the client's insurer is. I have to look up that service. I have to look up the rates associated with that service. I have to determine what the rates are for that particular payer. I have to determine whether that diagnosis is billable for that particular service or that particular clinician. Um, I got a whole bunch of things I need to do. And that's what we mean by the, the processing uh, that we have to perform on that raw service that's been entered into the system. Once I've done that, though, once I've processed, pushed the button, processed those services, I now have a, a, a hunk of data sitting there that's ready to be built. I have a bunch of records that are ready to be built. And in this particular case, I have a series of uh, unbilled charges totaling $2,100. Um, I have a history of the processing that's occurred. Um, I have the fact that uh, I've set a goal of not going over $2,000 in unbilled charges uh, associated with this, and, and uh, uh, I turn red because I've got a bunch of money sitting there. Now, maybe I'm only allowed to bill that payer or payers once a month or whatever it might be, but I know that I've got uh, money sitting there that I would like to be going after and pursuing. I have my accounts receivable. 
I have the unpaid balances. Um, and uh, once I've sent those bills out, once I perform that processing that creates the 837 or the CMS 1500, I beam that stuff out there, I mail that stuff out there, and money comes back in, and I have unprocessed remittances. Now, those might be an 835 that I pulled in automatically. They might be self-pay uh, payments that I've received, um, but I enter those payments, and then I have to process them meaning apply those payments against a particular charge. And then if there uh, isn't a complete payment at that point, I need to look up to see if there's another payer involved, self-pay or another insurer, and I have to do the waterfall to that next payer. And then I, I uh, have to have whatever is now remaining to be billed to that next payer move up to unbilled charges, and I begin that, that re recurrent cycle uh, associated with that. Um, all that stuff that I'm doing up here creates general ledger uh, transactions that I have to either beam over on an automated basis to my general ledger or I produce a report and I type in general journal entries, however I choose to do it. And down on the bottom where it belongs, I have some stuff that I don't know what to do with, which are, um, Alan can't seem to find his way there. Um, uh, the final row down there, I have unapplied payments, which I have to go in and work on once in a while, particularly with regard, and hopefully, going forward almost exclusively with regard to self-pay payments, uh, particularly where I received a payment from the client as he or she was leaving the office, uh, and I don't yet have a service to apply it against that's been entered uh, by the clinician. And so that should be the bulk of what we call unapplied payments. But I'll, I'll stay up on the top there. That's it. Flip back to the RevMan one, if you would, please. Um, so there's that, um, and it's all there somewhere in a form, uh, but if I go back to Echo Vantage, um, uh, this is the flow, this is the process. So um, I'm going to do a little orientation for you. Um, if I click on unprocessed services, I'm going to get a list of all of them that are sitting in there, and I have the capacity to filter on those things and do dates and stuff. If I click, and this is a standard, if I click on the top box, then all the records will be selected for processing. If I unclick on the top box and I click on individual boxes down below, um, I can click on you know an occasional one or two, and if I hit the minus sign in the top box, they're unclicked and so on. In any case, this is where I would create a job associated with um, uh, the uh, these processing of services. And I'm not going to go there quite yet, but you'll see uh, um, two other tabs up here, a history tab and an errors tab, and I can click on those and I could go there, but instead I'm going to quit out of here for just a second. Um, and Basically, if I click on unprocessed services, I go to where I just was. If I click on last process, I go to the same place, but instead, I'm positioned on the history tab, on the middle tab. Okay, so I jump directly there. I can go back and forth. There's nothing that says you can't. But the, if I want to look at the history, last process, I get that information here. And you'll see some stuff on here, stuff that's not yet finalized, and I also have examples of some here that have errors. Um, uh, notice, for example, that the processing for John Doe or whatever that is has a total of two errors associated with it. And if I go back, Alan, to the uh, front screen, uh, to the vantage point, and I click on errors, I go to the same place again, actually, just to show you, if I go back to create, um, uh, and I click there, Alan, you'll see that's the one I was just on. If I go to history, um, you'll see the screen I was just on, and now I'm on errors. So the front screen, depending on where you click, it just takes you to this particular spot. Um, and now if I go here, oh, Alan, you anticipated me. That's the first time this entire, 20 years, that's the first time you've ever anticipated what I wanted you to do. It's incredible. Um, this is a special moment between Alan and me that we're all, we're all sharing with you. Um, uh, if, if, and so here are those two errors associated with wow, pointing over here, uh, associated with those two jobs. If I click on the top one, I don't think it matters. Um, 
down below I get the detail, and I might have one or three or 37 or 237 errors there. Um, this one says error. Uh, no payers exist for this client and service definition. No payers exist. And so you'll notice it's blue, and therefore it's a link. So if I click on that link, it comes up in that particular client, um, bum, 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 uh, uh, Don Jones, and I am ready to add a pair for that particular client. I'm ready to add the pair. So that when I get an error, um, I, I, this is not for people who don't know what they're doing, um, but it's helpful for people who don't know what they're doing because it will take you to the place where you should go to fix the error and save you all the time of searching for Don Jones and finding where you add a payer for Don Jones and so on. Um, I, I, unfortunately, last night I fixed the one where there was no gender entered for somebody and uh, that was way fun too. But um, uh, the It doesn't work in every possible situation. Let's do one more, uh, just to show you an example. Uh, if you could go back uh, and go to the other job, I think it was the first one that had errors on it. And yeah, there are three errors in that particular one. And services on hold for authorizations. So if I um, have a nice, clear answer like that, I go right to the authorization screen, and I have the capacity to add authorizations associated with those screens. I can't tell you that every error will have an automated link associated with it yet. Um, there are some that are uh, harder to do, um, uh, but mostly it's just we haven't gotten to them. And so as you, well, we'll do, we'll figure it out. But if you have one that, oh my goodness, I make this error or my staff makes this error all the time and you haven't created a link for it, just tell us and we'll connect up that, that one. We're doing them one at a time as we, as we get to them. Everyone understand what I'm saying? The basic rule of thumb is you got an error, we want to give you the capacity to click on the error and jump right to the place where you can correct that error. Um, if I go back then to the main screen, um, to the vantage point screen, um, the others look the same. If I go to unbilled charges, um, you'll see that same stuff on the top, the create history and errors, and it works precisely the same fashion. Consistency, simplicity, oh, and, and speed. Okay, so I haven't talked about speed. One of the reasons for doing a foundational change to the billing thing is to speed it up and to make the reliability and the consistency of the record locking as close to flawless as we can possibly make it. Meaning that you don't have to get out of doing that in order for me to do that, number one. And number two, instead of it taking this long, it ought to take a lot less long to do the next step. Now, we haven't done a huge array of speed testing. And speed testing isn't wildly meaningful because it depends so much on your data and the specifics, how much bundling you can you do and um, uh, how complex your rate rules are and so on. There, there are a variety of things that influence um, uh, the speed with which your stuff will perform. But as a, 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 an example, um, one of the components we tested recently in processing took about 40 minutes to perform in clinicians, that, excuse me, in revenue manager, 40 minutes to perform that task in revenue manager. Um, we came back uh, with running it in Echo Vantage, took four minutes, took four minutes. Pretty common result in terms of the impact. Diane, Diane, where are you? Are you here today? Yes, Diane, in the corner. Diane sets high expectations. It's kind of annoying in some ways, but um, in, in this particular case, it's great. Um, she's wonderful. And she said, that's no good. It shouldn't take four minutes. And so a little bit later, it took 90 seconds. And so um, that thing that took 40 minutes to do in Revenue Manager now takes 90 seconds in order to do here. And, and folks can talk more about that. Again, exactly what your experience will be. Um, might well be different, um, but it won't be twice as fast or three times as fast. It'll be a whole lot faster than that in 
almost all of the big processing situations, just to give you a perspective. One of the things that you have to do in order to make that fast is to normalize the database. That means we couldn't leave all the data structures exactly the way they were. Um, uh, tables that had gotten really wide and had lots of, lots of fields in them instead become smaller tables, skinnier tables that are linked to another table and another table. That's much faster in SQL to perform those tasks. That means some of the custom reports that you've written for yourselves won't work out of the box. You'll have to look at the database and look at how those changes uh, might affect you. That's what we mean by the agency self-assessment and the impact on you folks. That's one of the most painful things we had to do. We didn't try to overdo it. We didn't try to do it purely make changes for the sake of making changes, but we had to make changes in order to speed things up. Um, uh, if I go over here and just to orient you to the screen and I select uh, a Medicare, I think it was, payer, um, you know, filters are available here. I apply those filters, and of the $2,000 in unbilled charges, $1,500 is to Medicare. All of the amount owed in the uh, accounts receivable is to Medicare, and 114 of the unprocessed remittances are in Medicare. The, that means that from this front screen, you will have uh, not only the capacity to trigger all of the processing tasks and to select what you want to process and so on, but you'll have information, you'll have data, and you don't have to go back to the revenue manager screen, but you have no data on the revenue manager screen. This tells you what you ought to be doing next. No, it doesn't. It suggests to you what you might do next. Uh, we're not that bossy, yeah, so we're much nicer than that. So, but, but it tells you where you need to go in order to get the cash, and, and that's your job. Your job running this stuff is to generate the revenue that enables the agency to actually achieve its mission of providing services to people with behavioral health issues. And that's, that's the tool we're trying to give you here, is something that's powerful, that's fast, that's easy to use, that when you leave and the next billing person comes on board, that the, you know, the four hours of training that you're going to have to give to that person, um, th this, is, this is something you might actually be able to make a dent in. And we'll have training materials and we'll have videos and we'll have stuff like that. But the idea is to make this a much more practical thing for people to do. Medical billing is still hard. And so I'm going to show you just a few more things. I have no idea what time it is. OK, OK. So if I go to configuration for a second, um, and I go to components, so remember you saw the service entry uh, on the clinical screen that I showed you. They only had these five components to each service entry. And you can have five or four. If I click on location, uh, this is where I enter my locations. If I click on the little uh, uh, pencil thing, that's where I can change uh, the location to the word office if I wanted to change it there. And it'll change it everywhere in the system. Oh my God, don't change anything, Alan. Um, uh, and uh, 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 <laughs> thank you. Um, there you go. OK. So, so, so um, Kathy would be so angry at us if we were. So she has her own database. Oh, go crazy, Alan. Do whatever you want. OK. Um, uh, so so cl close out of here. And, and then hitting the big plus sign here um, would be where you would add a whole other component. So if you wanted to have the ability for clinicians to enter uh, you know, mileage uh, whenever they enter a service. They don't have to use it, but they can enter mileage. You could put that here. If you have a severity index, a simple number, and you don't want to put it into the progress note, but you want it right here, uh, or a category, whatever, you could stick that in. So whatever you want for those categories. I believe that in addition to the five core ones that we typically use, I think you have 10 more that are available to you. So you have a whole bunch of things you can create in addition to your structured progress. No. So if I leave here, and again, I'm, I wanted to give you a sense of what the thing feels like and the consistency of the look and feel. If I go, Alan, uh, under configuration to filters, let's go to filters real quick. So filters, if I want to look at alcohol and drug, I have no idea what's here, um, uh, and I click on program, uh, 
So here I could mark four of those and have them all uh, mapped to that particular filter. If I hit the plus sign and I created, a, a, I wanted to use another component and I wanted to use recipient, um, I could combine it and say, gee, I want to create a filter that finds for me all the clients, all the services that were delivered on Oak Street, at the Oak Street office to groups and be able to record that or make that a particular filter that I would have. And there are a whole bunch of places in the system where these filters that you create and that you manage can be applied. Um, uh, we're jumping out, yeah, configuration, and I go down, staff's boring, service definitions. So if I go to service definitions and I click on the uh, individual therapy, can I go down further? Uh, I could search, but I don't have to. I found individual therapy. Um, so I have a, a, a service code. Um, if I go to uh, components, um, I would have the components I wanted for individual therapy. I might have three or five. I might combine that by hitting the plus sign with only in the office do I want this service to be uh, considered a 908 whatever, um, or uh, school-based individual therapy might have a different rate. So, so I create the rule by, by which I define this service as being this particular service, what mix of components. Rates. So if I go to rates and I go down a little ways here, so this is the default rate for this individual psychotherapy service. Notice you have the capacity, <laughs> I'm laughing at myself, um, uh, at the capacity to enter the minute ranges here and have it modify the, some people get it, uh, that modify uh, the, so I don't have to enter a, a service code uh, with a different rate, a whole different category, just because of the number of minutes of the duration. I, I can put it all here, create a table, and it will compute the number of, of um, units associated with that. So it greatly simplifies the development. What doesn't it do? It doesn't let us push a button and easily, perhaps at all, convert your existing services table into this. I can't do that because we've given you some capacity to do stuff better and smarter, you're going to have to re-enter your service definitions. It'll be way faster than the original time, but it'll take longer than just leaving Revenue Manager alone. <laughs> it means a task that will be associated with your transition to this new product. Um, this will speed stuff up too, by the way. That's one of the kinds of things that affects the speed of performance. Um, if I click on progress notes, and I don't have a lot of stuff in here, but if I indicate, remember I'm in service entry. So if this service is individual psychotherapy and I click note required, then the progress note forms is active. It's not anything in here. Default service note is the only thing that's in here. I apologize for that. But basically, if I have eight structured progress notes, one for a nursing note, and one for a uh, uh, da -dum -da -dum, for an individual psychotherapy by a, a social worker. If I have a, a medication note, uh, if I have a case management note, and those are all formatted differently, this allows me to attach to that particular type of service a particular note. So when I'm the clinician and I go in and I am a nurse and I put in my staff code as nurse and I'm providing a nursing visit, when I click on note, I don't have to pick from a list of notes. The note that I have assigned to nursing notes is the one that will pop up. So for the clinician, no decision to be made. What you do determines the format of the note, which I think makes sense. Not in all cases. And so you have the capacity to pick from notes as well. There are, there are going to be exceptions to that rule. But this gives you a nice, easy way to attach a particularly formatted note. I'm going into more detail than I'm going to be able to. Let's go a little quicker. Configuration. If I go down further, oh, remember, I just typed in the rates associated with individual psychotherapy. Now I'm going to go to payers, and I'm going to go to, okay, you go there. We'll see what happens. And I go to, and th so this is the payers, not the client pair, but I'm creating my payer database. If I go to rates here, 
Um, okay, now follow me here. See, bundled partial day says default rate. So this, um, this is Medicaid managed care, and they use the default rate that I entered attached to the service. So will Blue Cross and Anthem and Cigna and other people will use that, unless I say I don't want that. Unless I say this payer gets a different rate. And then I have the payer rate. See, it says payer rate instead of default rate. So if I click on alcohol and drug, now I have the capacity to enter down below all the information necessary to compute rates associated with that particular payer for that service. If I go to family counseling and I go to the default rate, I don't have all that stuff. See down at the bottom there? It's the default rate that's back in the services table, okay, where I've created the rule for that. And so they all will be utilized, the default rates attached to the service will be utilized unless I pick a variation for this particular payer. Um, uh, if you go up top on that one, Alan, um, and I, uh, this is the magic button, override service definition default. If I click on that button, then I'll be able to enter a rate that's different for this payer versus the default rate that I'm going to use with my other payers. Uh, I go one more time to configuration. I'm nearing the end, I promise. Um, and I go down to uh, user groups. I don't know, I think that's where I want to go. If I go to user groups um, and I, I go to administrators and I go to menu options. So this gives you a little bit of sense of some of the security associated with the system. This is where you turn on and turn off the rights for people. You, you get assigned to a user group. That was that administration group that I selected or I asked Alan to select. And then this is where I indicate what menu options I have rights to, what things I have access to, uh, and so on. And again, look and feel is consistent, simplicity is the goal, and you get some idea of what we're trying to achieve. If I jump, Alan, did we attach the help to this? Click on it, let's see what happens. Let's try and break it. Um, we're going out to the web. And we're looking at uh, the outline of the help we have here. Um, uh, if I went to, I don't know what's in here, screen navigation glossary. Uh, I've got some screens and I have some, I don't have a lot of glossary. Um, and I have, I have some stuff. Yeah, I have some stuff. Um, some of it's pretty good and some of it's very complete. Uh, I also have some videos, which I won't try to run from in here. Um, you see video tutorials. They're also up on top um, and uh, uh, other components. So um, the idea is to provide you with a level of responsive help that is um, up to date, that's new, that's comprehensive, and that's much more easily used, much more easily searched, and much more video oriented. We, we want to make sure um, that the way you learn uh, is supported and it's particularly for newer people and particularly for clinical staff we want to make the capacity to um, watch a movie about how to na navigate around the timeline to be as easy as possible. Um, uh, and if I click on reports and I go wherever you want to take me, fiscal, and I go to an aging report maybe, I don't want a crummy old audit report, um, and I go to a summary aging and I log in there, we've um, put this in your way, this won't be there when you're done um, doing this, uh, we won't save anything, and if you just say everybody include all payers and include all programs and include all uh, whatever, so yeah, I think you're good. Um, uh, there aren't a lot of records in here, and so this is popping up very quickly. It will pop up quickly. All these reports are built using SSRS, um, the Microsoft SQL Server reporting system. Um, uh, they uh, are accessible to you, so you can take one and edit it and modify it uh, rather than have to build something from scratch. So uh, where we've already built the um, 
queries that provide the breakdown by number of days. You, you can take advantage of that query. You can make a copy of that report, edit it, modify it, and then reattach it to the uh, menu uh, or attach it to the menu. You can attach your own from scratch built reports. Generally, they'll work faster than the crystal reports that you've had uh, up till now. Uh, they're easier for you to create and attach um, because the creation of the filtering uh, is just an easier thing to do. It's just simpler for you to build your own reports and attach them directly into the menu system. Um, is this a huge change? Probably not, uh, but it is a change. Um, uh, and we hope you'll be using fewer and fewer of these big, bulky reports. And so I am going to ask you to do one more thing, Alan. You're going to go back to Echo Vantage. You're going to go to uh, Claims Management. And <laughs> Kathy, where are you? OK, so she's tearing up. Um, this is, uh, 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 if, if you would go to a client, Alan, um, I, uh, Buzzle, Lucas Buzzle has something in there. Uh, if you could do that and hit uh, search. So these are the, the transactions, uh, the services uh, associated with uh, Lucas Buzzle. Uh, and if I click on one of those rows, Alan, the top row would be fine, um, I think. Um, I'm going to get the complete detail associated with Lucas Buzzle's um, service and that particular service. I'm going to get the history of the waterfall. I'm going to get copays. I'm going to get rejections. I'm going to get the waterfall billing. I'm going to get all of that information. Uh, and if I go back to the, um, the front screen, I'm going to get, um, I'm going to have that capacity to do it, not just for an individual client or an individual service, but I could pick a payer and a group of services on a particular day. Uh, or a, a particular range of dates. I'm going to look at the detail associated with that. I have an awful lot of capacity to quickly query the database in a way that hopefully will keep me from having to wander through a lot of the large sort of big dump reports uh, that you utilize on a regular basis. Try to minimize that, try to make much more of this um, accessible on the screen through quick queries uh, into the database. Um, uh, oh, I could keep going. No, I'm going to stop. Um, uh, uh, this is different. Uh, the uh, revenue manager experience is being replaced by something that isn't just new, uh, but it's better. And it's thought through with 35 years worth of experience in the medical billing world. And the simplicity associated with this is um, is amazing. I mean, it's it's as simple as you can make something that's really, really hard. Uh, it's it's the best I think we could do. And certainly, if you have suggestions about ways to improve it, uh, ways to if you go to the fiscal overview, ways to improve this graphic to provide uh, more information or better information or whatever. But simplicity, simplicity, simplicity is a big goal for us on this side. But it's a change, and it's not a trivial change. But it's one that should be so attractive to you that we hope will be fighting you off by the end of this peer-to-peer -peer session as far as your insistence on being first in line to, to get this stuff. Um, the goal was different with regard to clinical. On the clinical side, transitional, uh, smooth transition for clinical staff to move from where they were a few years ago using the administ administrative clinician's desktop into the VHR and then continuing to uh, web-based um, uh, uh, assessment instruments, form designer, treatment plans, et cetera, and continuing that by uh, eliminating all the remaining components of Delphi code and so on, making it all web-based, all consistent looking. The goal was very different. Power, speed, simplicity on the uh, billing side, um, smooth transition, simplicity, and speed all associated with the clinical side. Uh, and we've gone a long way. Stuff's not finished. Stuff will never be finished. Um, we'll always be doing more, but over these next few months, 
the remaining pieces that we have set as minimum uh, expectations will be completed and we'll be looking for more and more of you to begin moving in that direction and the event today at three will start the process of capturing from you uh, and getting you thinking along the lines of what do I need to do at my agency to be able to get my hands on this and to have this work for me and that's that's not a trivial task and it's one that's very personalized and it will involve each of our customers talking with us individually. There, there's, there's no mass way to do that. We need to have a conversation with each of you to make sure that transition is as smooth and simple and guided as we possibly can make it. I will stop there. That's a strong, wow, I just ranted to that beautiful voice of Robert Frost reading that poem, and you're stuck with me here for this past hour. What can I answer? What are your questions? There is a microphone in the middle. Um, I am the town moderator in my town in Madison, New Hampshire for 32 years. Um, I run the town meetings. And in New Hampshire, town meetings are the real deal. That's where you vote on whether to buy basketballs for the gym or to paint the outside of the firehouse. Um, and every penny that is spent by town government is decided at those town meetings. And one of the tricks is to make some crotchety old guy who's had four or eight beers actually get up and stand at the microphone. And, um, uh, and it is always a guy, and he's always crotchety, and he's pretty much always had four or six or eight beers. But if, if, if you have questions and you would like to ask them. Um, no, 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 no. The people who step up to the microphone are the non-drinking people uh, in the audience there. Um, we have fun at our town meetings. We really do. That, they're on video. Well, actually, I should share a town meeting video or two, or maybe just a highlight film of some of the people uh, that we have speaking. What, what can I do for you? Come on. Questions? You're saving them all for Kathy so you have someone competent asking, answering the question. I'm going to be around, and I'm going to be bubbly because I'm so excited. This is not typical peer-to-peer -peer for me. This is a big deal. So last time I'm going to do this, big major change, something radical like this, and I want to get it right and it's not finished. Um, lots is finished. People are using it. It works. Bills are being paid. Money's coming in the door. But I need, um, I need to make sure we really finish it right and we get some of the bells and whistles in that will really make it special. So you've got to make sure you ask for those things. I knew someone from Oregon would get up and speak. <laughs> well, um, there's so much. It's kind of overwhelming. And so my question is, where do you start? Um, I think the self-assessment will be helpful. If, if you sort of ask yourself which aspects of clinician's desktop and revenue manager, but clinician's desktop you're currently using, um, uh, which of those things do I want to make sure aren't lost and so on. So that will help you pin down when you can plan for a transition um, because if I need to have um, prompting for signatures, through the, um, the messaging system, um, then you'll know you can't move forward together. So that'll help you with the time frame, give you a sense of when you'd be able to make the change. Second set of questions would be around, what do I have for, my opinion anyway, what do you have for um, WinDesi forms that you're continuing to use, and how do I transition those WinDesi forms to being uh, form designer forms. Do I do those myself? Do I want Echo to do a couple of them? Do I want Echo to do all of them? I mean, I've got to make a decision like that. What reports do I have that I really rely on? So there are all these reports floating around in there. Which ones do I have to? So you have to kind of see how you're using the existing system. And then it becomes sort of a counseling session with um, someone at Echo, probably with your um, account manager, to have a conversation about um, uh, sort of your time frame that would work for you, what needs to be finished in the product for that, what are the, what are the work tasks associated with you, uh, with your transition, form designer tasks, custom report tasks, and then um, we need to talk through with you which pieces you're going to need to redo 
such as the configuration of services and rates. I mean, that would be the most obvious one that you'd have to deal with. A lot of other stuff around payers and so on. There's stuff we're going to convert for you, but there are other things that are harder to do. So I, I, think, I think you should view this as the beginning of a process. My hope would be, you know, for those of you who are really anxious, it would be a, a four-week process um, to work out with ECHO your time frame in January or March or whatever to make the transition, um, uh, or July 1st. Um, uh, so some of you could do it quickly. My hope would be that by the end of this year, you would all have your plan out in front of you, what your schedule looked like, what the tasks were associated with it, and decide whether you wanted to do this you know, for July 1st of 2018, whether you wanted to wait longer than that. We have not established a uh, sunset date for CDT RevMan. There's no deadline that you must get off of it. We want to use a carrot, not a stick. We want to make it so cool that you all want to make that move. Um, at some point, it becomes unreasonably expensive for us to maintain old stuff and unreasonably expensive for you and dumb for all of us uh, to keep the old stuff running. And so that will be a factor. Another factor, um, those of you who are operate in the SaaS environment where we host your software, that's the easier place for us to do this. We're limiting people in these first few months to being people who are in the SaaS environment, the hosted environment, to people who move over. Um, it's up to Matt and the team to make it um, really easy for people to move over into the SaaS environment if this is the right time to do it. If you don't want to move into the SaaS environment, we're one of the few vendors that won't make you do it. If you want to continue to host the software locally, you'll be able to. We'll permit that. Um, uh, but there'll be, there'll be a loss in that process a little bit, I think, in terms of, of the update processes that you have to manage and so on. Um, and we want to make it really attractive and relatively inexpensive for you to move into the host environment. Our, our, most of our competitors now require that you run only in their hosted environment, it gives them certain levels of control. What we'll never do, what we'll never do that they do is say, gee, we're going to do an update. These are the things that are in the update, and this update will occur in 30 days. We will not do that. We don't do that now. You have, if you are in our hosted environment, you have a sandbox. You can play with a new version. You don't trigger, well, you trigger the release. We don't trigger a, a new release and have you dealing with those changes whether you're ready or not. We make sure that you're, I'm jumping around. My point is that my hope is over the next two or three months that you'll feel comfortable laying out your plan for your organization. Can you do one piece at a time? Can no. You do okay. <laughs> that, that wasn't even polite, the way I answered that. I've been up here for too long. And, and I, I think you can understand why, but you could ask technical people. It's not practical to do that. Hey, George. Why would we give Larry a microphone? Because that has my question. I had three beers. <laughs> no, no I, know, I know you didn't have three beers. No, I know that. Go ahead. Um, when are you going to be ready? I mean, <clears throat> this, this product that you're talking about, uh, looking at it it, it, it has some very attractive things about it, and based upon how you set it up in your mind and then how it works in reality. But when, when will you be ready to say that this product has everything in it that we're going to put in? Never. Never. Okay. No, and ser quite seriously, but never. When will it be ready to where a certified community mental health center could function with it that's doing integrated care? Um, so we've been jerked around a little bit by our friends in the federal government and the meaningful use process. Um, we had sort of a series of steps that were all laid out um, that um, by their delay, <clears throat> excuse me, of meaningful use three, that, that that's, we've had to rethink that a little bit. The way I would view it is this. For the organization, the little organization that's doing just billing, those are the people we're signing up now. So the customers of ours who use the exact product, 
that is in Ohio that we acquired, um, they're all um, able to and are beginning or have already done the process of moving into this product. So they're doing Ohio billing uh, out of the product at, at this point in time. Um, for the organization, let me keep going a little bit. For the organization that um, uh, is residential, uh, it's relatively small, in, not in terms of budget necessarily, but in terms of volume of services. They've got 70 adolescents on a campus uh, somewhere, and they're billing uh, once a month uh, for each of those 70 kids uh, associated with the organization. They're doing treatment planning. They're doing progress notes. They're capturing individual services. They're not really doing scheduling at all using the system at this point. The kids in school during the day might be. Those folks are able to make that transition today. I think for the um, sort of typical organization that has some mix of outpatient activity along outpatient counseling along with whatever mix of other stuff. Um, I think you absolutely have to have the scheduling and in the next you know couple of months we'll be looking to provide that scheduling component along with treatment planning, along with progress notes, all that stuff that's in there now. And people will be ready um, this year, um, around the end of the year to make that transition. For the organization that is looking for meaningful use uh, certification, I'm a little hinkier about what is the exact time frame associated with that. I would tend to think um, uh, that the way they've changed it, that we're good for the first quarter of 2018, meaning it might be February, might be March even, before we'd encourage somebody to move over. Um, uh, in order to be uh, meaningful use two certified and to have the initial batch of Meaningful Use 3 stuff that we've been certified in uh, in the system as well. So around the end of, of March for those folks. For CCBHC, I can't really answer that question because the state variations are not trivial and they're a moving target as far as I can tell. Um, and we're looking to learn from you. And in this case, I'm not talking about the plural you, I'm talking about the singular you, Larry, um, uh, and, and a handful of other customers uh, about what is being required in Oklahoma or Rhode Island or other places where we're engaged in the CCBHC activity. Uh, and I'm less clear there. I don't see any reason why an organization would have an absolute barrier beyond April 1st of 2018 to moving forward with us if there are barriers, and there might be. I mean, when you give us the feedback and so on, uh, there may be a barrier that arises. But our goal would be to be pretty fully ready for everyone by April 1st of 2018. We do not expect all of you to be ready by April 1st at all uh, above 2018. There may well be uh, any number of you that aren't. But that would be, that's the kind of time frame we're talking about. It would all be during that period that different members of this, or, this audience and of our customer base will become ready over the next six to nine months. I'll, I'll go that long um, with regard to pieces of functionality. And then it'll be up to you as to when you want to come on board. That's the purpose of doing this agency self-assessment and then your individualized counseling sessions with our staff members. Looking forward to the therapy session. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> we don't even charge for that part. That was a long answer to tell me April. I, I, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have answered you that. I should. It's just like no. I should have said April. Yes. I'm, okay. Can anyone come up with one more question that I can answer with one word, uh, and I'll try to stick to that. I was going to talk about artificial intelligence, and um, no, thank you. This is great. I, I really appreciate it. I really am looking forward to hearing from you. I will be, of course, in the room at three o'clock, um, and really looking forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you.